Thanks, Jordan. Well, I would invite you all to take a comfortable posture, uh, maybe take a few deep breaths, and receive the, the word of the Lord. Today's reading comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. And we're going to be reading from the NIV. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The word of God for the people of God. Sweet. Good morning. Oh, goodness, I need a little bit more than that. Good morning. How's everyone today? Stephen mentioned me earlier, maybe Jordan did. My name is Rob Morgan, uh, one of the pastors over at the Delaware City Vineyard. I've uh, been around this community for a while. It's so good to see and be with you guys. Um, it's surreal for a couple of reasons. One, this was the actual room in which the Delaware City Vineyard had its launch service in 2009. September 6, 2009, 15 years ago, this stage... I literally built it with my own hands. Carpeted it. That sound booth didn't exist. DCV constructed that because you can't really see if you're standing on the ground. So it's so many wonderful memories of being in this space. Our church was birthed in this physical location. And so as you guys have been gathering in this space over the last couple of years, uh, watching the different changes, uh, and as, as uh, I think Stephen mentioned, uh, I happened to meet Hope and Jordan and Randy and Steven and Haley and Brad probably six and a half years ago. We met at Chaffee's. How many of you have had a coffee at Chaffee's recently? We met at Chaffee's. They reached out to me out of nowhere and said, we're planting a church. We feel God calling us to plant a church in Delaware, Ohio. We'd love to talk to you about what your thought is and ask some questions and pray together. And from that moment to this, it has been a wonderful friendship. Uh, it's been all the things that church planting and church leadership is in a small community like Delaware. Um, there's familiar faces in this room, or there's still probably familiar faces from this room in our space, as occasionally folks uh, shift the spaces in which they worship for any number of reasons. Um, and there's been like multiple ways that our churches have actually co-labored together that you might not be aware of. Uh, we run a food pantry called Feed Delaware. Uh, it's been one of the most consistent ministries we have to the city. And when Delco was planted, one of the ways that you guys came alongside and served with us was to actually volunteer at our Feed Food Pantry to come and to care for those guests and folks who were in need of practical assistance. Um, Stephen and Jordan, how many of you guys remember this thing called COVID? There was a pandemic. Do you guys remember there was a pandemic a few years ago? Uh, we kind of cruised right through that low impact uh, on churches in particular. Uh, but anyway, we held a hybrid learning center, which was like our attempt to figure out how to help families who had parents that worked, but kids who needed some connection and supervision. And Stephen and Jordan staffed that. It was like one of the few things that was actually happening where people imagine how do we help families navigate this moment? So we had a dozen kids that would gather with us during the week. 
Stephen and Jordan staff that. We've done something called Emotionally Focused. A number of you guys have been through that. And then Stephen and I had the joy of coaching together uh, the Delaware Hayes boys soccer team for a number of years. Uh, actually coached uh, one of your beloved congregants, Joe, was on uh, one of my soccer teams and assisted with us as well in a short window of glory at Delaware Hayes High School Soccer. So you're, you, are, you are amongst three former coaches of the Delaware Hayes boys soccer team. Now just think about that. By percentage, this is the most coaches gathered in any room right now. I don't know what that means, but it's just true. This right now is the most former Hayes coaches gathered in one spot. So, and then let me just acknowledge Zoe, wherever you are, uh, this is the scariest thing for like most people. Standing on a stage with a microphone, so when you said, I'm not sure why this is nerve wracking, it is like the most nerve wracking thing for lots of people. People are scared of like small spaces, spiders, and talking in public. And actually spiders are less scary than talking in public for most people. So you're like, no, spiders always win the day. Well, I've been invited to kind of continue in your missions uh, series, and super grateful, super humble to do that. Um, I don't know if I have a ton to offer uh, that you guys don't already embody, if I'm honest. Uh, there's a heart of mission embedded, not only in this church, but in this denomination, which informs all of the ways that you think about your presence, your presence in a community, your presence in this moment in time, your presence on the face of the earth, your presence in your neighborhoods and in your schools. So like, I just want to share a few stories, encourage you guys, and hopefully pray for you as well. Uh, there's a thing that the founder of the Vineyard Movement many, many years ago, a guy named John Wimber, uh, not a name that you might know, but if you ever think about it, look him up on YouTube, you'll see some cool videos, grainy, you know, captured old school videos. But he said every believer, every person who encounters the love of God needs three conversions in their life. The first conversion would be what we, and by conversion, that can be like, it's actually a relatively common word, but in religious circles, it means like a turn of your understanding, like becoming different in some way, shape, or form. And even as we just had a beautiful time of worship, Jesse, thanks you for leading us in that. It was amazing to sense God's presence. His affection filled the room. Did you sense that? His love filled the room. We read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his son. Well, he also loves the world presently and sends his spirit to remind us of that love. And I hope that you sensed God's deep affection for you. And when we encounter God's affection, we are often turned his saving grace that he sent his son to die for us that we might have life and life eternal when we receive forgiveness. That's like the first major experience of conversion that people have. That we sort of wake up one day and we realize whatever I've been doing probably hasn't been working. Whatever I've been attempting to give my life or my worship to probably hasn't been satisfactory. And all of a sudden we're awakened to our deep need for God to encounter us. And when we have that, we then begin to look around and realize there's other people who've had that experience. And those people are now our like family. And our family in the context of the Christian faith is called the church. Second conversion is people need to fall in love with God's family. I don't know if you've experienced this. Maybe it's even been part of your own journey. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear, especially in our current culture, people love God, but you know, the church, I'm not so sure about the church. Has anyone had an experience where I love God, but the church thing, kind of messy, not sure I like these people? Yeah, raise your hand if you've had that encounter. Cool. Most of us have probably encountered it, if not felt it ourselves. I have a dear friend who's a pastor of Vineyard Church. She said, that sentiment is sort of like saying, I love God and I don't like his kids. That hits a little bit differently, doesn't it? Especially for a room filled with children, right? There's so many beautiful sounds of kids and what they bring into the life of the family that we have to fall in love with the church and realize that you have been adopted into a family. And that's like a heart posture of affection, even in all the flaws and faults and weaknesses and disappointments that occur in relationships. And then the third conversion is a conversion to God's cause. Conversion to Christ, a conversion to his church, and a conversion to his cause. Now, they don't all happen sequentially. Sometimes we actually get converted to the cause of God and understand, wow, there's a, a God on mission in the world, and I want to join that mission, and then we encounter Jesus along the way. Or sometimes we grow up in a church environment and realize, I love the feeling of being a part of a community that's got a story bigger than my own, and in that story, encounter the love of God and then enter on mission. So it's not if it's, if it's sequential, 
But there is a reality where each one of us has to make sense of Christ, figure out how we relate to the church, and then how do we join God on mission in the world, which is exactly what you're sharing and exactly what Zoe shared in her testimony. Is how do I live on mission in my everyday life? And there's some aspects of our story that help that, and there's some aspects of our story that challenge that or make it harder for some of us. So I'm just going to share a bit of my personal story, read out of Matthew 25, or at least land Matthew 25, and I'm going to give you one question, and I know you normally do table discussions. I don't know the timing of our morning, how all that's going to work. So I'm going to give you the question now. So if you're like a note taker, here's the moment to take a note. If you're not a note taker, just stare at me and imagine memorizing what I'm about to say. Jesse, you got it? You're memorizing this moment. <laughs> what of your origin story, what of your childhood story, what of your family story helps you engage the margins, the needy or the poor in your every day? What of your origin story helps you connect to the needs of your community? What of your origin story hinders your ability to move towards the needs of others around you? Right? We all have different upbringings. We all have different families that we've grown up in. And some of our families help us connect to the larger story of God in the world. And some of our experiences actually hinder that from being the normal outworking of our everyday experience, how we see the world around us. So I'll tell you a little bit of my story. Uh, my father uh, graduated college in 1971. How many of you were born or alive in 1971? Three of us. Uh, I was born in 1975, three, so that's not three of us. It's only like now two of us. I've just dropped a couple off the bus. Um, and my father's first job was a special education teacher. So he worked in a public school as a special education teacher, providing uh, direct care and instruction to a special needs classroom. And in 1973, four, five, that was not a community that had tremendous services or resources. Um, special Olympics hadn't even started yet. My parents were volunteers at the very first Special Olympics, which was sponsored by John F. Kennedy. How many of you know that name? I hope all of us know the name John F. Kennedy. But it was that era of our country just five decades ago in which the needs of special ed folks was met in a way that was formal and official. And so my dad was a special ed teacher. And I remember my earliest memories are us providing what would be commonly called now respite care to families who had special needs children. And so on a Friday night or a Saturday, I'd come home from school or we'd gather around the meal, you know, the table for dinner, and there would be three or four young men or women, adolescents, school age kids with special needs who were gathered around our table and across a variety of levels of functioning. So some folks that needed to be fed, I spoon fed the meal, other folks who just needed to be attended to with unique needs, but that was like the home I grew up in. So I remember growing up and just the normal thing was strangers at the table and specific needs that needed to be attended to as we watched and cared for those. Uh, there was a thing that I don't even think it could exist anymore, but there was a thing that I, I grew up on the East Coast and there was something called the Fresh Air Fund. And the Fresh Air Fund meant that children from New York City would get on a train, they would end up in communities like the one I grew up in and children would be assigned to families to spend two weeks like camping or playing outdoors because the kind of urban city life didn't have those offerings. Could you imagine that happening today? Like putting your kid on a train to send them to strangers when they're like nine? That was like the norm. Again, this is the 70s and the 80s. You're probably like, that probably wasn't helpful for many folks, but it was the experience. But again, our family just would go to the train station and have a child assigned to us for two weeks and just welcome someone in and try to provide an experience that they might not have because of where they lived or what their upbringing was. Um, take that into my high school. I went to a high school that had 38 first languages spoken in it. If I asked some of you to name 38 countries, you'd be like, don't pick me. 38 different first languages. The most common class that was in our high school was ESL, which is now ESOL, English speaking uh, for other first languages, right? So people who were in our school environment because of where I grew up new, near New York City. So I grew up in this incredibly diverse experience around people of all different sorts of needs, experiences of people with different socio and racial and ethnic and linguistic uh, backgrounds, people who immigrated first generation, people who had grown up in part of immigrant communities, all sorts of experiences. 
And now I only want to share that because I just simply would say this. From the time that I remember, there was a, a value of hospitality that existed in the world I grew up in. Now, I just want to insert this component. I didn't grow up in a home of faith. These were parents who looked at the world through a lens of how can they be helpful with what God has given them without God in the story. They had resources and time and availability and a commitment to serve. And it wasn't connected to a story of God or Jesus or anything that materialized in the outworking of the life of faith. And so that's just my experience. And you and I each have different homes that we grew up in, different ways that the story of the poor or the marginalized or the refugee or the immigrant has been a part of your experience. How do you make sense out of people who don't have all of the practical assistance that maybe you grew up in? Or how do you make sense out of folks who have moved here from other parts of the world, war-torn countries or otherwise? How do you make sense from people who have been incarcerated and then are living in community? How do you make sense of diversity racially, economically, ethnically, socially? What are the ways that we engage the things that cause us to be just different in the world, different experiences. Well, my experience was it was actually quite normal to be surrounded by people who were different than me. And I had a radical encounter with God when I was 25 years old. It's almost the start of a joke. A bartender in Southern California on a business trip with two homeless men, two in the morning, September 1st, 1998, led me to Christ. And in that moment, it was as if the story of compassion and hospitality and awareness of others was connected to its source. Does that make sense? The story of like, how do we attend to others? How do we make space for others? How do we create room at the table for people to find a place of belonging? All of a sudden got plugged into the gospel message and I went, oh my gosh. This thing that just seemed random and happenstance is actually ordered in the way God has created the people and then commissioned the church to be on mission. And so I don't know if you have a, a life verse. I remember when I came to faith, this was uh, in 1998. It was like a, a habit of people sort of prayerfully asking God to give them a life verse. Does that still happen, those of you that are younger? Is anyone encouraged to seek out like a life verse? Yeah, I don't think so. That's when you just like date yourself. I have a daughter who's 21 and a daughter about to turn 18, and I'm like, do you have a life verse? And they're like, I don't, what does that mean? But it's a verse that for many of us anchors us and orients the way we think about our purpose. I had, uh, you guys read Matthew 25, that's, that's my life verse. That's the verse that I think God has put in me to orient the way I think about my purpose, but more so the purpose of the church in the world. The purpose of the church in the world. See, we can think about mission through a number of different languages or a number of different lenses. Um, if you read that text and you, and you blow through it pretty quickly, you can get stuck on the spaces where God speaks about the hungry and the thirsty and those who are sick and those who are in prison and those who are strangers. We can get stuck in just that frame. And that's an incredibly important frame to hold on to. That there's this thing that happens but if you dive into it a little bit deeper, if you, if you, well, let me just say it this way. If you don't dive into it a little bit deeper, then the very people we might encounter in mission become objects of a mission and potentially projects for a church. Right? I don't know if you know this, but people don't like being projects. Is that fair? Have you ever had an interaction with somebody and you realize, oh, I'm your project. Sometimes that happens in our marriages. Sometimes that happens in a dating relationship. Sometimes that happens in an employment relationship where you realize, oh, you need me to do something as an outworking of the thing that matters to you. I'm the focus of your project, and you are now the project manager, and you're trying to manage my life. That's happened to most of us, I would imagine. Well, let me just offer a thought. Hold this forever. People don't like being projects. They just don't. People like being people. And people aren't your problem. People are always people. And people aren't projects, they're always people. What Jesus does in this text is he actually inserts himself into the very people 
that we often think are problems or projects. So we try to remedy the things in the world through initiatives and programming and all sorts of ways, which aren't inherently bad, but they can create a framework that still creates us-them dynamics in the world around those who have need, those who have experienced misfortune, those who are under-resourced, those who are in other parts of the world, those who've had trauma or tragedy, and all of a sudden we still operate from us-them dynamics. This text for me has been so helpful because if you just allow it to settle in for you, what Jesus says is anything you do for the least of these, you're actually doing it for me. Not just for me, to me. Just hold for a second. Anytime you extend mercy, kindness, hospitality, a practical outworking of the needs that are around you that you become present to, you're not doing it for Jesus. You're doing it to Jesus. Now let me just offer one thought as to why that matters. Let's just, can I, can I call us church people? Can I do that? The reason why I think I can do that is because where are we this morning? Church. If we were all at Speedway, I could call us Speedway people. If we were all at whatever. But we're church people this morning. Uh, and church people gather, whether you know it or not, to encounter God. When we gather, the forms of our liturgy, the way our services are established, trying to create a moment or multiple moments or a framework to understand how might we encounter God in the world? How might heaven come close to earth at any given time? How might I become present? So Jesse leads us in that song, and I can't sing that song without crying. I know it's not much, but I have nothing that's fit for a king. You know my favorite Christmas carol? Little drummer boy. I don't have much, but I can play my best. Right? And in that song, I just come unglued. I picture myself as like a seven-year-old going, da, 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 like a drum corps. And then it says, and he smiled at me. Right? We are desiring an encounter that is in two directions. One, that we encounter him. And two, that he receives us such that we experience his smile on our lives, his love and his affection being poured upon us. And so when we gather in these spaces, we share testimony, which you guys have done. We read the word, which you guys have done. We sing songs, which you guys do occasionally, but not always. We do other things to open up opportunity for us to encounter heaven. Here's what I can tell you. I promise you, if you serve the poor, you will meet with God. I promise you, if you visit the prisoner, you will meet with God. I promise you, if you welcome the refugee or the immigrant or you tend to the widow or the orphan, you will always meet with God. Because what he says in this text is whatever you have done to the least of these, you do it to me. Which means he is embodied in the needs of those all around us. This is like metaphysical. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just programmatic. It's like literally Jesus is saying, I inhabit the very people that you attend to such that it isn't just someone who needs your help. It's God himself who is present in that exchange, in that encounter, in that moment. So when we run our food pantry, one of the things that we tell folks when they volunteer with us is I want you to be inefficient in a kingdom framework. This is not about pushing people through a system fast. It's not about ticking off how many numbers and how many things and like did the Tetris board line up perfectly so that at the end of the night we're like, we crushed it. That, that's a temptation for some ministry programming. How efficient can we be? If Jesus was seated in front of you, how fast would you want that time to go? 
How fast would you want that time to pass you by? Right? You've been to a fast food restaurant recently. If you ever get a chance to see the screen that they're operating off of, time of service, they have metrics by which their time of service needs to continue to reduce. 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Get people in and out the door, 30 seconds. Whenever ministry to the margins takes on that posture, the people that lose out are you and me because we have a moment to sit with Jesus himself who shows up to us poor and hungry and thirsty, who shows up to us as a stranger in need of hospitality, who shows up to us as a prisoner in need of their dignity and humanity to be inserted into an environment that steals their dignity and their humanity. Jesus, in the eyes and in the mouth and in the body and in the hands and the feet of all of those who we have the joy What's great about this text is the people didn't even know that's what was happening. They say, Lord, when did we see you in this manner? When did we see you? Here's the beauty. When you see people rightly, you see them with the value of Jesus in their humanity. So here's my question for you guys to wrestle through. And not because this is a word that, it just simply, I hope it's an encouragement because your partnership with DreamWork, or not DreamWork, that's a music, a movie studio. <laughs> I literally said it this morning. I was like, DreamWork? No, Dream Center. Say Dream Center. Don't say DreamWork. And then I said DreamWork. Your partnership with Dream Center, your use of this facility, your connection to the broader church, your willingness to share stage with those from parts of the, of, the, of the world that are doing ministry and for your dear sister Zoe to stand up in front of you and say, how do I live on mission to those all around me? And my invitation would be everywhere. Everywhere you attend to the needs of those around you, you attend practically to those needs in very real ways. And you have the opportunity, the joy, the privilege to encounter God himself, which is the desire of church people. <laughs> you're navigating, especially you with young kids, you're navigating this weird daylight savings thing that just happened. Which is like, I think it's nap time in their body, but it's not nap time on the clock. <laughs> That's challenging. In every one of those little kids, Jesus. In every act of service to the poor, Jesus. In every attempt to share a meal with somebody who's got a brand new baby or to, to do something for the, for the prisoner or those who have been released from incarceration, anytime you attend to the sick and the needy, whether by vocation or simply because you're aware that your neighbor has been diagnosed with cancer and there's going to be needs that they have and in that move towards them, Jesus, 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 Jesus. So if you're asking yourself, Lord, how can I encounter you? This text gives you a foolproof path. Serve the poor. Give food to the hungry. Give drink to the thirsty. Welcome in the stranger. Attend to the prisoner. Clothe the naked. All the ways of practical assistance provides care to those around us. So the question, again for you, would be this. What in your story moves you towards the margins easily or with greater awareness? What about your story inhibits your ability? Are strangers people that you can welcome or people you should be afraid of? Right? Some of us grew up again in that era where stranger danger was the way we were taught to be safe in the world. Well, there's a similar version of that playing out in our geopolitics. Stranger danger. People who look differently, who experience things differently, who think differently, who may even vote differently from you. Be leery and weary and afraid of them. And I would just offer in that posture we forfeit the promise of encounter that Jesus offers us through this text. So I'd like to take a moment and invite us to respond. I'm attending to the time and know that there's um, 
kind of a next thing where we do get to actually share a meal with one another. We get to be at the table together. We get to eat together. We get to fellowship in a way that invites us to be with even those we don't know well, to be strangers in the room. But I'm going to pray a couple of prayers, and then I'm going to have maybe one or two ways to respond specifically from prayer as well. Just put yourself in a posture, maybe close your eyes and allow whatever prayer moves towards you by way of the Spirit bringing life to it uh, to just settle on you. And I pray your spirit would come right now, Lord. Would you fill us with an anticipation and expectation of what you're doing in the room? And I pray specifically uh, for anyone in the room that has something that's connected to your story, the family you grew up in, uh, sort of your childhood, the sense of your purpose that you might have imagined when you were just little, like three or seven or nine, where you began to imagine, what is my purpose in this place? And I pray your spirit, God, right now would come and would highlight the experiences we had that makes moving towards the margins easy, that we were aware of a friend who was different and needed someone to help them be safe at the lunch table in elementary school. We were aware of moving into a new school district ourselves and wishing and wanting for someone to make a path into friendship and connection. For others, we've traveled the world and we've been the foreigner on foreign land as much as this is our home. We're aware of what it means to be different for other reasons. For some, we've entered into rooms where we've been the minority all of the time, and other times we're not even present to that experience. I pray, God, whatever our story has been in relationship to those who are different from us, those who are on the margins, those who are far, those who need safety. Would you bless that? And now in that same space, for anyone who is looking at your story and attending to your story and you're saying, I have been taught a story to fear the other, to be suspicious of people who are different. It shows up in ways that we don't want to say out loud, but we hear someone speaking another language and we're suspicious. We hear someone dressing in a different way and we're suspicious. We see circumstances and we say they must have put themselves there or they should have made better choices. We find stories that surface in us. And I pray, God, that you would cause us to attend to that story. And now, God, I pray that you would open up our eyes. That you would open our eyes to see the need around us. That you would open our eyes to see the poor and the hungry, and the thirsty and the naked, and the sick and the imprisoned. Give us eyes to see the people that we are often tempted to ignore, the end of the exit on the sidewalk, the person with a difficult personality at our workplace, the neighbor whose yard signs we are really, really upset by, and where the differences that we can see become inhibitations, uh, inhibitors of our relationship, or where might we see with your eyes? Give us eyes to see. I pray, Lord, you continue to bless the heart of this church to be on mission in this city and to partner with those who are as well. Do you multiply their efforts with your kingdom generosity? I pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen and 
Amen. Thank you guys for letting me share with you for a little bit. Hopefully that was something. <laughs> Stephen, you coming up? Thank you, Rob. Absolutely. As we close, actually, Rob, will you just stay up here? Yeah, please. Um, yes. I hope you just hear Rob's invitation that the people or even the city, it's not a project that God's spirit, Jesus himself, is in the midst of those places. Mm -hmm. So the invitation.